In this video, we're going to continue our conversation about servicing refrigeration systems and talk about charging refrigerants. Now, it really doesn't matter what type of system you're working with. This could be air conditioning. This could be refrigeration. This, I mean, this could be just about anything as long as it's a vapor comp compression type system. So charging a system is to add or replace refrigerant in a system. Now, refrigerant, contrary to what a number of people are telling customers, refrigerant is never used up. It either leaks out or it is contaminated by water, acid, or most importantly, non-condensables. However, if you did evacuate a system properly, the water and non-condensables will not be there. Acid might be left over from a prior compressor problem or prior contamination. But the water non-condensables should not be there. So there's different methods of charging refrigerants. Some of them are acceptable. Some are no longer acceptable. So let's start with weighing them in. We use scales to check the amount added. That is your 100% most acceptable method now of charging refrigerant. Use a scale. You can measure it in using a dial a charge cylinder. Those are very rarely used okay, anymore. We'll talk more about those, but you won't see them there very much anymore because there's some danger to them. You will use superheat and subcooling eventually. Okay, You first weigh in the refrigerant to what you took out or what the factory default number is that the factory charge number is on the data plate. And then you use superheat and subcooling to dial it in closer. It's combined with weighing in the charge. You have to allow a system to run for 10 minutes before you take your readings. Sight glass is a method that used to be used before the new refrigerants. Okay, it's never used anymore to check the charge. It's not accurate and it varies based on system conditions. So just because you see bubbles in the sight glass does not mean the system is undercharged. I've seen a number of contractors in recent years stop putting sight glass on systems because customers tend to look at it, see bubbles, and think there's a leak. And it's a lot of extra service calls that turn out not to be any leaks. Amperage or wattage used to check charge. Again, do I take amperages as I charge a system? Oh, yes, always. But would I dial in a charge with it? Would I make sure my charging is accurate? No, it's not accurate at all. Okay, don't use this method unless you have no other options, and that's rare. Now, I did say that I do use, I do always have an amp clamp on a compressor as I'm charging, and that's just to make sure that I don't put any liquid into the compressor accidentally. If the amper shoots up as you're charging, you need to stop your charging while it's for the amperage to return to a normal level. So it's sort of important to have an amp clamp on, but you don't want to always have it on. Refrigerant can be charged as a vapor or a liquid. Now there's some, there's some um, restrictions to that. So vapor charging entails taking vapor refrigerant out of a, refrigeration, a refrigerant drum and putting it into the low side of the system. If the system is not operating, you can add vapor to both the low and high sides of the system until the pressure equalizes. Okay, so again, vapor charging is mainly in the low side of the system. If you have an operating system and you try adding vapor on the discharge line, you're actually going to attempt to push refrigerant back into the tank. It doesn't work. If the system is running, add the vapor to the low side only. High side is under a higher pressure than the vapor in the drum. Opening the high side on a running system can put too much pressure on the refrigerant cylinders and actually cause them to explode. So again, vapor gas will flow towards the cylinder if you open the discharge line. So only open the suction line if you have a running system. In some cases, the refrigerant drum may be cold and cause it to have a lower pressure than the low side of the system. You can warm up the drum or the cylinder using a hot water bath or heater blanket. Take the cylinder and put it, put it into warm water as you're attempting to charge. That will boil the refrigerant off inside the cylinder. 
okay? Don't put it over 90 degree water, okay? Just, again, you don't want to increase the pressure of that cylinder too high. So there are some advantages of vapor charging. It's the easiest way to add refrigerant to top off a running system. Liquid refrigerant by using a vapor cannot enter the suction side of a compressor. Vapor is allowed. There's some disadvantage. It's a slow process for adding large quantities of refrigerants. High drum pressures can actually force the oil out of the compressor. And most important, blended refrigerant refrigerants may fractionate or separate as they are charged. So always look at the tank, okay, and make sure you're even able to charge as a vapor. Currently, the two refrigerants that you are allowed to charge as a vapor is R22 and R134A. There's some others, but those are your most frequently used. If you're not using R22 or R134A, do not charge as a vapor. You have to charge it as a liquid. It's a blend. Liquid charging entails adding refrigerant in the liquid state into a system. In a non-operating system, you can add liquid refrigerant through the king valve on the receiver. The king valve is the service valve on the high side of the system by the receiver. If it's an air conditioning system or a system that does not have a receiver, you can add the liquid refrigerant right into the liquid line. Again, this is only on a non-running system. In an operating system, you can front seat the king valve, jump out the low pressure control, and be careful not to overcharge. Okay, what you're basically doing is you're going to block the compressor, the return from the condenser, the feed from the condenser into the liquid line, and you'll be able to charge right into the liquid line while the refrigerant is starting to pool in the, in the um, receiver. But just make sure you do not overcharge because you can actually blow out compressor valves if you accidentally do. This is, not, this is one you don't want to walk away and leave the system charging. So again, this is an example, okay? You've, you've um, front seated. So what's going on is your liquid refrigerant is coming out of your tank, going to your high side of your gauge, okay? And it is actually being pulled in okay to the to the receiver in this way okay it's actually being pulled in and going into your evaporator your refrigerant that's coming out of the running compressor is going through your condenser it's condensing and it's ending up back in your receiver as a liquid if you overcharge and fill this receiver and then fill the condenser you're going to put liquid refrigerant into that compressor do not do that so you cannot walk away from this. This is something I do not recommend doing. Okay, and again, you have to jump out the pressure switch to do this. Liquid charging an operating system through the low side is also possible. This is what technicians most often do to add refrigerants to a running system. You have to be careful with this. Again, you do not want liquid refrigerant to go into that compressor because flooding may result. And I, there's just a note here, experienced technicians only. Don't do this if you're unsure of it and always have an amp clamp on the system when you do this. There are commercially available charging devices for charging liquid in the suction line. It acts like a metering device. If a compressor becomes cold or frost starts to develop, stop charging with a liquid, let it boil off. If you have frost starting to develop on the compressor, it means there's liquid in it. If you have an amp clamp on the compressor, which I highly recommend, and the amperage goes way up, okay, very fast, all of a sudden, you will have liquid in that compressor. That's the easiest way to see if you have liquid in the compressor. Watch the amperage. Let it boil off and then restart. Liquid charging, it's fast and it's convenient and refrigerant will not fractionate. The blends we use, like 410A and some of the other blends that you'll use in refrigeration and air conditioning, they don't fractionate if you charge them as a liquid. Okay, just be careful with it. Disadvantages is you may have to turn the system off. It's easy to overcharge. So weighing in refrigerants is usually used 
done using an electronic and electronic charging scale. Dial scales can be difficult to use and inaccurate. Set the charge on a dial and the scale shuts off when complete. It's not digital and they have faded from popularity. Electronic scales are portable, they're less expensive, they're accurate, and you can, but you cannot walk away and allow charging to occur without you there. You must watch that scale. Electronic charging scales are a combination of the electronic scale and old dial -a charge scales. They're accurate and they're automatic. There's a downside though. You will lose refrigerant from the gauge, from the hoses and the scale itself once you're complete. So just be careful with this. Okay, this is the old, older charging scales, okay, the old charging meter. There's another method too, we don't see it that often anymore, but it still does appear on some EPA testing. Dial a charge, you put refrigerant in a cylinder up to a line and then charge the system. This is like the old graduated cylinders that you see in science classes. It's not used anymore as they're really not safe. The technician must handle liquid refrigerant. You're dumping it out of the refrigerant cylinder through a hose into the, into the graduated cylinder. Then you're taking that graduated cylinder and you're connecting it to a system. There's just too much, too much possibility for a technician to be um, burnt by liquid refrigerant. And liquid refrigerant will burn you. It's cold as it boils off. This is an example of the dial of charge old graduated cylinders. Again, don't use them anymore, okay? I can't even find them in the supply shops, so it's a, probably a good thing too. Um, the electronic scales, this is a computer charge, electronic scales, okay, put out by CPS. Okay, this actually, you connect your refrigerant hoses down here on the bottom, right there. You set the scale for the specific weight you wanna put in. The scale includes some, um, valves that will shut off the flow of refrigerant when the correct weight is you is hit. It's actually pretty accurate and it works well. So the steps to charge is make sure the system is a vacuum and do not remove your gauges. Okay, if you remove your gauges, you're going to get air into those gauge hoses and you're going to have to put the system back into a vacuum. Connect the cylinder to the small center hose on the manifold. Open the refrigerant cylinder. Purge the air out of the center line. Open the center manifold valve and allow the refrigerant into the charging manifold. Decide on low or high side charging. Place the cylinder onto the scale and zero the scale out. Open the high or low side valve on the manifold depending on whether or not you're going to do low or high side charging and weigh the refrigerant in. Again, you cannot use the high side if the system is running. Okay. So again, you've connected your refrigerant cylinder to the center port of your gauge. You have high and low side, okay? And you obviously are watching, you're gonna, we'll talk more about this, but you're gonna be watching your subcooling and superheat. In this case, it's measuring suction temperature, so you're gonna watch your superheat. Okay, you're gonna open your low side gauge handle and you're gonna weigh that refrigerant in. This doesn't show the scale under the cylinder, but it should be there. While charging a system, watch the amperage of the compressor. If the amperage goes above the FLA, which is the full load amperage, shut off the valve and wait for the amperage to stabilize and drop. Never, ever walk away from a system by char while it's charging. So again, you're going to watch the amperage. Once the system is charged, check the superheat and subcooling prior to remove the gauges. Close all valves and remove the gauges. Double check for leaks and clean up your work area. Don't forget about the valve on the refrigerant cylinder and don't forget to suck the excess refrigerant in your gauge hoses into the system. Record the quantity of refrigerant that you have added to the system. Watch the difference in your the gauge pressure as you are charging. The gauges can be misleading. So a few troubleshooting things. Low charge will cause insufficient cooling, long run times, continuous running time, high operating costs. Your evaporators will ice up. The superheat will be higher than normal. 
if your superheat is above 8 to 12 degrees on a refrigeration system, okay, that does not have a TXV valve. It's very, it's very likely that you're um, undercharged. Subcooling may be higher as well. Low charge will also have low amperage, low wattage, suction pressure low, discharge pressure low. Compressor temperatures will run higher than normal. Again, the refrigerant flow through the compressor is part of what, um, what cools the compressor. Overcharge will be shown by a high suction pressure, high discharge pressures. The compressor will be sweating all over. You'll have flooding, which means liquid in the compressor. High wattage, which means high amperage. You'll have high current draw and you'll have little or no superheat. If your superheat is above is below 8 degrees superheat, it's very likely you're overcharged. Liquid filled evaporator, okay? Very inefficient and very dangerous to the compressors. So that's a little bit about charging. We still have one more overview of the charging we're going to go through. But that is normally the final step of a refrigeration service procedure that involved removing the refrigerant to do repair work on the line sets, evaporator, or any of the major components.